unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Job chapter 8, the seventh verse. He says, Though thy beginning was small, yet thy latter end should greatly increase. I read that again. He says, Though thy beginning was small, yet thy latter end should greatly increase. Not might, not let's pray it could, let's expect it will, let's try to think it might. He said, your latter end should greatly increase. Greatly increase. Greatly increase. The word there, should, is a verb. And it is a verb that indicates both one a possible event, but a dutiful event. It's something that must happen. It is something that must happen. It's a must. It's expected. It handles your expectation. You are expected by divine duty to greatly increase. You are expected by divine calling and assignment as a child of God to greatly increase in the end. And I love that he used the verb should because it's not supposing, it's not just a piece of advice. It is deeper than that. You must, you should, you will. More than just above will, you must. It's expected for you to increase in the end. Now this reality for me is mind-blowing and yet very simple to understand. There are many people who, by reason of the things that they have gone through, the situations that have happened around their lives, their families, their relationships, their career, their ministry, whatever touches their life, they've had many ups and downs. And some people have gone through some of the worst stuff any human being could ever go through. And some of you, if it's not for God, you'd not be alive. If it is not for God, you'd not even know how to live in the period that you have lived. The things that try humanity are so appalling and individually people have stories of being a man of God and sitting in counseling to hear stories upon stories I have been broken you know to hear some stories and some stories are so sad so bad that you almost think if it is not God to come through this person's life might never change for good but I have good news for you today I want to talk about the God of growth and increase all right, these are things that are so dear to my heart and I've expressed in different sermons from different facets, from different directions as the Lord has impressed on my heart. And tonight I felt a qualification again to share a certain, you know, mind of God touching our increase, our growth. All right, and then I thank God for Job 8, 7, that though your beginning was small, and what God is trying to tell us here is that it does not matter where you begin from. Right? Paul says, let us consider, brethren, our calling. Not many of us were noble. Not many of us were wise after the way of men. Not many of us were mighty after the way of men. But the Lord called us. He chose the foolish things of this world that he might shame the wise. All right? God is saying that no matter where you begin from in life, it doesn't matter where your beginning is. It doesn't matter whether you come from the poorest family. It doesn't matter whether you come from the smallest tribe like Saul was. It doesn't matter whether you came from the most insignificant place. It doesn't even matter whether you never had a family. It does not matter whether you never had, you know, a good education. It does not matter whether you were not raised with the right connected people. It does not matter the networks that you were raised at. It does not matter the day and month and week. It doesn't matter. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, whom we all serve and love, was born in a manger. The name of the man who hosted them in that inn, we don't even know the name. But all we know is that he was born next to animals. This is the King of glory and Lord of lords. I always tell people it doesn't matter where you begin from. 
probably were not born, you know, in an affluent family, like some people are advantaged, all right? And even your parents' affluence is not yours, okay? But no matter where you begin from, no matter where you began life from, this is a conversation that does not care or mind where you're beginning from. Or probably you began well and, you know, hit shipwreck and everything left. Or you messed up in life and now you're at the point zero. All right? God always has a definitive grace to turn to the man who says, I'm beginning from here. Oh, yes, I've messed up 20 years ago, 15 years ago. I've done stuff that I'm not able to reverse, but this is where I'm choosing to begin from. And God said, well, this beginning is small. But he says, yet your latter end should, it should directly increase. That's the God I want to talk about. You cannot talk about growth. You cannot talk about increase and not talk about the principle of seed and harvest. Genesis 8.22, okay? He says, for while the earth remaineth, while the earth remaineth, for as long as the sun will come up every day and go down, for as long as the calendar will count the next day, the clock will tick the next minute or second. He has set laws that are submitted, that are ordered, that are ordained, that are functioning a certain way. God has connected these things to stay the same in that same course. And one of which he said is seed time and harvest. Seed time and harvest. Unfortunately, of course, when we talk about seed and harvest, it has been a law that has, you know, been so abused because of people who have stretched the truth and in their own lusts have taught or have opened their hearts to a very disturbing way of interpreting the blessing of God. And when you hear some people criticize prosperity, it's not that God's message to the church to be prosperous is wrong. It's just that the people who have handled that message so misleading to the ears and hearts of people that it has become so disturbing to even see what in some circles of the Christian faith we call prosperity and what that does to the ministers and the believers and how some people who are forgetting the responsibility of wealth and God's provision have gone ahead to define their selves, identities, anointings, glory, and influences based on how much wealth they have in the body of Christ or that the more richer the person is, then the more spiritual they are or that the poorer someone is, then the less spiritual they are. And this is not new. Before that, before even the church was taught of that liberation, if you read church history, you know, before our fathers came in to actually teach divine wealth and provision and prosperity. Before that, the churches were the poorest places to go. They depended on governments and institutions that used to twist the arm and control, you know, the faithful in two ways that were not even pleasing to God because they were the ones that were handing over the bread. And our fathers then felt that we have to teach the church to learn to be liberated, as the scripture says, to know how to fight with one hand and to build with the other. That liberation, I believe, by standard is key for every church, every minister. Every minister must know how, yes, to fight with one hand, but to build with the other, to know how to, yes, you know, build ministry, you know, and, and have success in the gospel, but as well know, you know, how to make it outside, you know. And through scripture, of course, I'll take time to explain that, all right? But here we're also discussing the law of seed and harvest. And every time we're talking about seed, when people think about money, people run to, you know, what you've given. Yes, that's part of the definition of seed, but it's not the only idea of seed. And sadly, it's the only emphasis that the church has pressed on through time in history. But I wanted us to go a bit deeper into this principle. You must understand the principle of seed and harvest, all right? Because the law of growth and increase is subject to the law of seed and harvest time, all right? The Bible tells us somewhere in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verses 6, he says, I have planted, this is Paul, again the seed is there, the seed is planted, he says, I have planted, okay? And the Bible says, and Apollos has watered, but God gave the increase. Because it's telling us we can only discern increase in the power of harvest. Right? The power of harvest teaches us the element of increase. We can only design increase in the realm of the harvest. All right? And so because you understand God that way, even as to go deeper in this, you go to Luke 8, 11. He says that the parable is that the seed is the word of God. The seed is the word of God. I want you to keep that in the back of your head, that the seed is the word of God. So yes, some of you have sowed seed of money, 
praise God, seed of cars, praise God, seed of lands, praise God, seeds of time, praise God. And all of those are seeds, but they all carry their bearing and are pegged on the ultimate seed, the higher law in the understanding of seed. And this is the word of God. The word of God comes in our hearts as a seed. God looks at the word of God as a seed. The things that I'm sharing with you right now are seeds that are being planted in your heart and they have the effect of growing in your heart. You had this police officer, he says his life has changed. From the time he came in contact with Fanero, you know, his wisdom in God has changed. His knowledge in God has increased. He has started to connect with God a certain way. At his workplace, he says that he has influenced the whole work area. You know, everybody is starting to connect to God because of him, you know. And then he says, oh, he had even given up on some dreams, but now he has enrolled back to go to law school. That's what the Word of God is supposed to do. That's what the Word of God should do. It should grow you. It should increase you. It has a way of doing that. All right? It must do that. You cannot listen to me for one week, two weeks, one month, four months, five months, one year, not change. It's not possible. It's not possible. It's not possible. Because I preach the Word. We teach the Word. You cannot sit under a sober teacher for a week, a month, a year, and not grow. That's not possible. There's just no way. Because the seed is being planted in your heart. Okay? So every time you sit before a man of God, Words are being planted, seeds are being planted in your ground of the heart. And consequently, as they are watered and given the right atmosphere, they'll sprout out and grow. Consequently, results will show forth that represent your submission, your commitment, and your due attendance to the word. These words are not in vain. That's why the ministry grows. That's why you grow. That's why we hear testimonies, because we want people to understand that this is the reason why we grow. It is the word of God. It is the word of God. Again, I'm trying to give you the antidote that connects us to this greatly increase, because like I said in the beginning, every child of God has the duty greatly increase. Not just increase, but greatly increase. You are the subject of increase. You are the source of great increase. It's your workplace, you have to see yourself as one who will bring increase. When I was hired in my former days of working for men, every time I was doing business with them, I knew that that business will increase because I carry great increase. I have the anointing that increases things. All right? In my days of banking, I knew that my branch will perform because I have the grace to greatly increase stuff. All right? It's my consciousness. Everywhere that I go, I remember when I was beginning ministry, before I even got to understand deeply these things, I remember one of those days I was in prayer, and the Lord whispered something that was so remarkable, and I'll never forget it. He told me one sentence that I'll never forget. He said, wherever you will go, I will feel. He said, wherever you will go, I will feel. Okay? There was never a building that I ever went into and preached the gospel, and the Lord never filled. It was never a building. Until we could not have any building to contain us anywhere in Kampala, Uganda. We didn't have any building to contain us. All right? And that is why we know that we know that as the word of God continues, I have never been intimidated about the size of a building. I will never be and have never been intimidated about the size of a stadium. I will never be intimidated. Why? Because I live on the word that told me that wherever you will go, I will feel it. This was a word he told me, and I've seen that come to pass. Because it's his work to do that. It's not my work. It's my work to believe him, right? Because I know that I'm the entity of great increase. That's who I am. That's what I believe. And I emphasize that because there are people who are so conscious about loss. There are believers who are so conscious about regression. There are believers who are so conscious about backward movements. There are believers who are so conscious about loss. They're just conscious about it, all right? In the events, sometimes things don't go like they planned them and probably they have less than they expected. Oh, yes, there were moments sometimes when people did not attend our meetings like they should or what we expected. But that never took away the bigger picture that we have in our spirit that we are for the increase. Oh yes, some days we rained and some people were not able to make it for the meetings. But because people have not made it for the meetings because it has rained or because of some other reason that we do not know, that doesn't take away our fixed mark of conviction. That wherever we go, we feel. And consequently, if that Thursday probably had two or 300 people less, the next Thursday it will grow to 500 or 600 more and we have to add chairs. Why? Because the thing in us must grow. And consequently, those that didn't attend probably will live stream and then you'll see the live stream numbers go up. Whichever it is, since 
since COVID began, we've had more subscriptions on YouTube, more subscriptions on Facebook, more people watching. Why? Because we carry great increase. We carry great increase. All right? And that's the consciousness you keep. Yes, you probably could do business and make a few losses. So what if you've made a loss of a million dollars? So what if you've made a loss of a billion shillings? Yes, it doesn't matter how much loss you could make. All I know is that I know a way to attract what I've lost, all right? Paul says that I know how to be full and abound in much, and I know how to be empty and have nothing. He says I'm instructed both to be full and to have nothing, and to lack. He is instructed. He carries the divine instruction to know how to be full. He knows how to be full. Philippians 4.12, he knows how to be full. To know how to be full. Okay? So what if you've lost a billion shillings? The challenge is not what you lose or what you have at that particular point. I always tell people, the question is, do you have the grace to increase? Do you have the grace to create out of nothing and have everything tomorrow morning? Yes, you can lose that. Oh, this might not come the way you expected it. Yes, but do you have the anointing? to increase it again? Do you have the anointing to grow it again? Do you have the understanding? Because Paul calls that instruction. I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. All right? So when Paul says I'm instructed to suffer need, he's not saying that I have instructions to be poor. To suffer need is I have instruction to be broad in my giving and give away everything and spend myself and be spent of all by divine instruction. But that doesn't mean that we are poor. Uh-uh, we cannot be poor. It should not be the life of a believer to be poor. But we have people who are so conscious about what they lost. They're so conscious about what is not working. They're so conscious about the things that are, you know, coming through and not coming through. They're conscious uh, about the things that did not work last year. And they're so held into that. And when they go for counseling and prayer, pastor, pray for me. I don't know why the businesses I do, all of them end in failure. And sometimes I don't know whether to educate the mind or to really pray. And if I should pray, should I pray that they will increase again so they'll lose it? again the next door should actually pray that they might come to the knowledge of how much great increase God has accorded to them by reason of the nature that they have in Christ Jesus. He is the God that teaches us to profit, not to loss. He's the God. He says it teaches us to profit. It's an instruction to be taught in profiting. It's an instruction to be taught in increase, to be taught into growth, to be taught in abounding in much. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to teach you how to be increasing. I want to teach you how to grow, to continue growing, that your business will grow, that your ministry will grow, everything will grow, your family will grow, your life will grow. I want to teach you how the law of increase and growth works. I'm teaching you how to profit, teaching you how to profit, how it works, how does it work, all right? Because there's many people who teach men how to survive, okay? I've had preachers how to survive during COVID. <laughs> You're not called to survive, you are not a survivor. No, you are above survival. You are a success. You are above survival. You're in the realm of great increase. You are in the realm of great growth and multiplication. God wants to add to you. He just doesn't want you to survive. You are not called to survive. Refuse to listen to things that teach you how to survive. Oh, you do this, you do this, and then you'll survive this, and then you do that, and then you survive this. No, 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 no. We are above survivors. We teach those that are surviving to go above surviving. We teach those that are surviving to go above the normal, predictable mediocrity that you see in the world, the things that are explainable, realistic in nature to say, oh, I'm actually this way because COVID came, or oh, businesses are not working because COVID came, or oh, ministries are stuck because COVID came, or, oh, you know, my career is on stall because COVID came, or oh, I was fired from the job, so what? Oh, COVID came, and so that means you're gonna go through, you know, one spiral after another of loss and loss and loss. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. That's not what God has called you to be. That's not where you are called to live. Child of God, that is not where you were called to live. Okay, if you've been in perpetual losses, start your beginning today. And God still says that word will be true today as it was yesterday, as it will be tomorrow, because God is the same today, yesterday, and forever. He says if you're beginning from small now, or some of you began two years ago, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, but wherever you began from, if your beginning is now, I have good news for you. Your latter end should be great. It should be great. It should be great. All right? Now, when we're understanding the seed and harvest principle, all right, and Paul speaks of how he planted. He's speaking about that planting, all right? And Apollos watered, 
and God gave the increase. God is in the harvest as he is in the seed. But we can only understand increase and multiplication as is revealed in the principle of the glory of the harvest. All right? And for those of you who are actually men of God, preachers of the gospel specifically, evangelists, pastors, prophets, teachers, and apostles, let me give you a little mystery here. When the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, Paul is teaching the church in kingdom wealth, all right, in the principle of what it means to grow wealthy. But this portion of scripture also alludes to the minister because increase is increase, whether you're talking of finances, whether you're talking of people, whether you're talking of career, whether you're talking of knowledge, understanding. The whole law of increase and growth can as well be explained even in this scripture. If you know how to increase finances, you should be able to know how to increase the rest of your stuff all the other areas of life because the principle is the same. Unfortunately, because some people are rich by accident or are rich coincidentally, they did not study the pattern of how wealth came. They do not know how to do the rest, all right? And this portion of scripture can help you. He says, now he that ministereth seed to the sower. Who is he that ministereth seed to the sower? It is God. This is where it begins from. Pastor, preacher, evangelist, businesswoman, career person, wherever you are. If you want to understand increase and growth, understand it from here. Firstly, God ministereth seed to the sower. He ministereth seed to the sower. Luke 8, 11, the parable is that the seed is the word of God. All right? So God ministereth. The word to the preacher, the minister that soweth, all right? The sower, the sower that soweth, all right? And he is the God that ministereth, the Bible says, bread for your food, all right? He's the God that ministereth bread for your food, all right? Now, I want you to understand this. It's one thing to minister from my understanding. It's another to minister from God, my source. Many pastors or ministers think that because they are referencing from the scriptures, therefore, they are receiving seed from God. No, that's not true. There's many people that quote this word, but do not have a relationship with the revelation of this word, and neither have they been instructed. It's all the art of knowing how to put words together and make very great orations according to how their minds are able to recollect these things. Those are for carnal, normal thinking men, and your results will be carnal and normal. All right? It's not just giving seed to the sower. He ministereth seed. Not the word minister. He ministereth seed to the sower and ministereth bread for your food, all right? Now, I want you to think it this way, that the people we minister to are actually being fed, all right? We're feeding their souls, like it's food, uh, normal food to the body. So there is food for the soul, all right? There is food to the spirit, and that is the word of God. It is the rhema, all right? And God is saying, look, from wherever you are giving seed, I have not ministered too, but you've simply found by reason of knowing how to connect, you know, look with John. That's not where I'm at to multiply your seed sown. I am not going to come in the increase and multiplication of things because you know how to connect scriptures. All right? It's beyond simply the realm of knowledge. There's an underlying understanding, and under that understanding is the wisdom of God. Okay? That is why he says, when it comes to our ministration, he says, let us wait. He speaks, oh yes, there are prophets, prophesy. Oh, to him that teacheth, let him teach. All right? But he says, on our ministration, he says, let us wait on our ministering. All right? Why do we wait on our ministering? Because we are waiting firstly for him to minister to us so that we'll become ministers of men. You can be a teacher, but not yet a minister. All right? And what's the difference here? The teacher is a gift, all right? The minister carries spiritual authority that justifies his voice in the spirit and approves him. The vindication of the spirit is to the minister, okay? The teacher can only be in the realm of accuracy, that you can be approved a teacher, that you are accurately teaching the word. And that's wonderful. It's okay, all right? To teach the right doctrine does not necessarily mean that you're going to change the world. It's more than just the doctrine it goes into the authority of the Spirit. 
Bible speaks of men who worship God with their lips, but their hearts are far. It doesn't mean that their lips are not worshiping God. No, it doesn't mean that their lips have not learned how to speak. Some men know how to speak. They're just great people. They speak and it's just wonderful. There are people over the years that I've seen and I've worked with friends of mine, people when they start speaking, you're like, how come this fellow's ministry is not a success? How come it's not a success with everything he says, with the stuff he assumes to know? Because it's more than just the stuff they're speaking. It's the authority of the spirit under which they speak. It's the affirmation of the spirit under which they confirm to speak. And when your affirmation is warped, it's dead, it's confused, it doesn't matter how much conviction is on your lips, you'll never have a justification to draw men. It's deeper than that. And that's the place of ministry. The minister must have a certain authority in the spirit. It's more than the words that I'm speaking. No, it's that thing in the spirit that qualifies and vindicates the minister before those that are watching him. Even those that doubt in their heart know there's something in them that is stronger than their doubt. Do you know there are people who might not believe in what I teach, but they just cannot stop watching me? <laughs> they might not believe what I teach, but they just can't stop watching me. They just find themselves tuning. They might even agree with me in many ways, but they'll find themselves tuning there because there's something ancient. There's something bigger than my words, okay? There's something that qualifies me before God. It's not in my own working and ability, no, but it is in the learning to wait on God. Preacher, pastor, evangelist, prophet, he ministereth seed to the sower and ministereth bread for your food. When you understand that place, then you see the multiplication of your seed sown. When a man has sat in the realm of ministration, the ministration of the spirit, right? When you have had enough seed ministered to you and not simply too much time to connect enough dots for you to have a sermon for Sunday or Thursday, but when you've been ministered to, Paul says, I will not speak some of the things which Christ has wrought by me or in me, that I might make the Gentiles obedient both in word and deed. When you have learned to wait on God and the words that are being spoken in you or to you, are ministered to you are the things that you're giving men. The Bible says your seed will multiply automatically. Your seed will multiply automatically. The Lord will multiply your seed, okay? He will multiply your seed and increase the fruits of your righteousness. The word of God will carry its effect. It will carry the confirmation of the things that are solely affirmed in your spirit as to be true. And this is not only for the pastor, it's for the businessman. How much affirmation in your spirit do you have? How much ministration of God is in your spirit concerning the physical business you do in the world of men under the sun? Nobody is a success in the world, no matter what they do, if they don't have a spiritual bearing. It's not possible. Some do witchcraft. Some sacrifice their own children and animals and sacrifice quite a lot. I mean, if people can get to the level of sacrificing their own children for wealth, it shows you just how desperate people can be, all right? And today in church, you're still dealing with, you know, Christians to even tithe. Oh, God. It's a bit of a shame to say, but that's not for me today. But what I was trying to share here is that learn to wait on God. Learn to be ministered to by God before you, you minister. The word, the seed, Luke 8, 11, is firstly your teacher before you teach men, all right? You are firstly told of God before you teach men. But have I seen in my life of many ministers who are able to teach what they are not able to be taught? Okay? They can produce results in men, yet those results are not in them. Paul says, I beat my flesh to subjection, lest after I have preached this gospel, I myself will be disqualified. There are many people who know how to teach people how to make wealth, but they are poor themselves. They have a million ideas of money, but they do not and cannot have the ability to make that money themselves. Yet if they suggested the same to somebody, that person can be able to make that money, okay? The Lord taught me something about that, the wealth of the kingdom and how kingdom economics work. He began with showing me the relationship some people have with wealth, you know. Some people have ideas of wealth but don't have the grace to make wealth. They have not connected to the grace that make wealth. So they can give ideas to men who have the grace, the visions of wealth, and these men of vision can execute them, but they themselves have no ability. 
One time I was sharing with a small group of people and I told them, look, Sony, the company, if you read their history, they did not have any idea. They did not begin the company with any idea, but they had a certain vision. And it was the vision and ability to make wealth that provided for every idea that would come to them to make that a child and give it life and it would live and sprout that into the success of that company that you see today. Okay, because some people don't know the difference between ideas and visions. Visions are bigger than that. They carry a certain ability to execute, all right? They carry the ability, the wisdom of application, of the things that you so see in your ideas. Ideas are important, but they're not the end of everything. There are people who have great ideas of building ministry, but they don't have successful ministries, all right? The people that are teaching in theology school of how to run great ministries, but they themselves have failed to run great ministries. And I say that those men, it doesn't matter how great they can teach, they're never going to be complete until they can articulate in manifestation what they seek to speak in their words. You're never complete if what you're speaking you cannot demonstrate. It's like me standing before sick men and I tell them Jesus heals, but I cannot demonstrate the healing power of God. I have a problem. And I tell people, for you to be the complete man, examine yourself and hey, we all have our journey, and I'm not saying that we're not under processes. God is working on us, and every other day, he's perfecting stuff in us. But at least there's evidence of things advancing for you and are making you greater every other day because you are seated and working with a God of increase and growth. Christians should never be sorry to greatly increase. It's the duty. It's a should in this equation. It's not a try or it's okay if you are never greatly increased as long as you love the Lord. Uh, 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 uh. You should increase. You should increase. All right? And he continues in 2 Corinthians 9, verses 10, where he speaks that this will multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. In 11, he says, being enriched in everything to all lack, no, to all bountifulness, which causes through us thanksgiving to God. Thanksgiving to God. In other words, your increase, your multiplication, whatever God does for your bountifulness, that brings praises to our God, thanksgiving to our God. People look to our God and thank Him. They celebrate God for your success financially, your ministry, your career. And may God do things through us continually that will cause men to give thanks to our God. If you believe it, shout amen in your heart. And so, he says, when you understand that waiting on God for his ministration in your spirit, all right, and your reaction to that ministration, how do you react to that ministration? If God gives you seed to sow, he's saying, I've given you the responsibility to give what I've given you. That means you're not just wealthy so your children will eat food and your wife will have clothes on her body. No, you are wealthy because you're going to make other men wealthy. You're deep because you want to extend depth to people. There are people who look at you as a minister, and to them, you have imparted the seed that it is actually possible to make it. You understand? Sometimes when we do these open meetings and you have 10, 20,000 people, 20,000 or 30,000 or 40,000 in crusade ground, and a young man sees and he says, oh, this fellow doing it is in his 30s. If he can do this, then it's possible. Some of us did not have connections to the greatest men of God in the country. We came from churches that used to drum. They never even had pianos to play. And so to see that, it's an inspiration to that child, that young man or woman dreaming to tell them it is actually possible. All right? So when you make wealth and begin from scratch and tomorrow is success, you're telling that young boy who's going to school that it's actually possible to be a success. If your marriage is working, you're bringing thanks to God to tell that newly wedded couple that it's actually possible to have a happy marriage. That's why we leave. To show forth the praises of our God who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. The people will look at the works that God has wrought through us by his grace. And the people will celebrate and say, indeed, God is good. Indeed, God is good. So when we wait on our administration, it's only to the level that God will entrust us enough to minister to others. To whom much is given, much is required as well. And he's saying once you're in that realm of ministered to, to be a minister, receiving bread for food, to share bread with men. You understand? That is why I don't understand a born again believer who is still struggling with the little things. In fact, things like tithe are small. Those are very small. But I don't understand a believer who struggles to give when he has understood how much has been freely given to him by God. I don't get it. I don't get it. How you can struggle to be a giver. All right? So, he says, as you continue in this, you're being enriched, verses 11, in everything unto bountifulness, which causes 
through us thanksgiving to God. And verses 12 says, whether you're a preacher, a pastor, business person, career person, whatever you are, in whichever realm you're functioning, he says, for the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgiving unto God. Glory to God. In other words, if you're a preacher and you understand how this service works, ministered to by God for you, and then you faithfully minister to men the same as you're ministered to by God, he says this kind of service makes sure that men are fully, the saints are fully supplied. And if you can fully supply to your own saints, how can they now start wearing off and swerving off and wavering into other places and ministries to look for food? Uh uh the people that are submitted to Fanero Ministries, they are fed well. They are fed well. They're not seeking. If anybody has sat under me and they're seeking, then, well, let me see what they're seeking for. Unless they're indifferent. But if you've heard the word for five, six, seven years, we've taught almost everything there is to understand about the new creation realities, to understand how to walk a victorious life. I demonstrate the things that I teach. And Anybody who has sat in one, two, three years, they can tell you indeed from the time I said, listen to this voice, my life changed. My life changed. It's what God has called every minister to be. And I'll tell you, I'm not the only preacher who does good. There are many other men and women, pastors, prophets, evangelists, teachers, that are doing the right stuff and their own course and they're seeing the same successes in their own ministries. All right? What I find a problem for me is how some men of God assume that they are the only men of God. Uh, 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 uh. The earth is so big. You have seven, eight billion people on the face of the earth. Even if you were pastoring 20 million or 500 million or 5 billion or 2 billion, there's still quite enough for us all. Children are being born every day and we're claiming them for the kingdom in the mighty name of Jesus. I have actually claimed children not yet born to submit to this message to the glory of God because it's bigger than me. It's life. It's eternal. It's timeless. It's not time bound. Like faith is not. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He says this will supply fully, sufficiently to all the saints and that it will redound abundantly to the thanksgiving of God. Abundantly to the thanksgiving of God. This is service. So you understand, to make wealth is service. To be a preacher of the gospel, you are a bond servant of God. All right? Whatever you do in your career, your education, you're giving a godly service, and it will be duly rewarded by that eternal God. Hallelujah, glory to God. So he's telling us, look, now you start to take the word of God more seriously because the word is the seed. You allow the word to saturate you. The Bible says, meditate on these things and give yourself wholly, wholly to these things that your profiting might appear unto all. Hallelujah, glory to God. Well, you don't need to tell people that I'm a success. No, people look at you and say, huh, this girl is a success. This woman is making it. We don't know what she's doing, but there's something working right with her. There's something that is aligning right with her. And I tell people, take heed when the people you fight are in the hand of God for increase. When the woman you are attacking is under the hand of God for increase, chances are that you are attacking the God of increase. You are judging the God that makes increase on that woman while you disqualify them. Or you can quote all your scriptures all you want, all right? But when you see the hand of God on a woman, on a man, be very careful. Because maybe, just maybe, that person, that woman you are attacking, one day might be the only hand to lift you out of that merry clay. Hallelujah, glory to God. So anyway, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 12, he brings that emphasis, if you read in the Amplified Version. He says, if you hearken, if you just hearken to these precepts and keep and do them, keep and do them, that's a faithful steward, one that learns to teach others, one that receives to give, one that connects so he can connect others, one that acts on yielding to the word because he wants as well to communicate the same because you are a conduit. It doesn't end with you. It's a double-edged sword. It receives to give. It connects so to connect others. It fellowships so it will create fellowship for others. It's the seed and harvest principle. It's a giving and receiving. It's just continuous in that it's double-edged in its ways. He says if you will hearken to these precepts, okay, that's one realm of the age, and then keep and do them, that's the other, all right? The Lord God 
God, the Bible says, will keep with you the covenant and the steadfast love which he swore to your fathers. It's telling the folk in Deuteronomy. Now, in the covenant that we are under, and I must put a disclaimer, we're no longer the ones that do for God to love us more. No, he loves us because he loves us through Christ and he's pleased with us because of Christ's ultimate sacrifice. But that doesn't take away, and I tell people who are teaching grace, that because Christ is pleased with us and he loves us, it doesn't take away our full side of the other agedness of the sword. The word is still double-edged. We receive and read the word so we might do it. We must be doers of the word. For if we are not doers of the word, James says, we deceive ourselves. Oh yes, God didn't love me more because I pray. But that didn't mean that I should not pray because God still loves me. That's foolish. Or some people say, oh, because God still loves me the same when I don't pray, oh, so that means I should not pray. No, it only means that your faith is dead. You're deceiving yourself. That's when the spirit of deception comes through. When we say God has forgiven us our sins, it doesn't mean that sin is light. It doesn't mean that you should do whatever you can and give in to your sensual impulses and do waste yourself on stuff that would destroy you simply because the grace of God is available. No, but the rather the more, you should actually do better because the grace is enabling you to keep the commands of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, the difference here with the New Testament dispensation is that grace is available to teach us. Grace is available to help us connect and align ourselves with these precepts to keep them and to do them. Hallelujah. And then it says, okay, that I will keep that steadfast love which I swore to your fathers. He says, and he, God says, he will love you. Oh, in the New Testament, he does love you. All right? And because of that, the Bible says he will bless you and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your body. That means you will not be barren. You will not be barren. And those of you who are listening to me right now and you've struggled to give birth, right now receive the power to conceive seed to bear yourself a child. You remember what the Bible says in Hebrews? For by faith, Sarah received strength to conceive the seed, KJV says, that bore her the child. What is the seed? Look at 11. The seed is the Bible is that the seed is the word of God. So Hebrews 11, 11, I thank God that in the KJV, the seed was separated from the child. Oh, if you understood this, you can't be barren. If you understood this, you cannot be barren. Not only physical, but any other way. So, as I'm teaching tonight, you are receiving strength to conceive, to understand the word, to conceive seed. And when she received the strength, when she received strength to understand, to conceive the word, the Bible says it was delivered of her a child because she judged him faithful who had promised. So God is serious. So as you're listening to me right now and you're burying in your womb, right now, receive the strength to understand the word that I'm teaching. You'll have children. Hallelujah. So he says, I will bless the fruit of your body and the fruit of your land, your grain, hallelujah, your new wine, hallelujah, and your oil. Not only physical oil, the anointing on you will have a certain distinction. There's something on you that will be fresh. Yesterday I was walking somewhere, I was entering a certain building and I find this person and they wanted to shake my hand. Oh, Apostle, it's a pleasure to meet you. And they started shaking from head to toe the power of God. And this was the first time that person met me. They don't even belong to my ministry. I think have seen me somewhere on video or something and said, oh God, Apostle, this is a man of God. And the next thing I know, this lady starts shaking and shaking and she starts to pass out. Why? Because the presence of God was around me. The oil on me was evident. It was evidently having effect on her life. Hallelujah. That is because I'm increasing every other day. There's greatness and increase on my life, as it is for everybody who believes this word and understands it today. It's not exclusive to special men of God. No, it's exclusive to those that are understanding. Okay, hallelujah. So this person says, the Bible says, that I will increase your land and your grain and your new wine and your oil, the increase of your cattle and the young of your flock in the land which he swore to give your fathers to you. He says, verses 14, you shall be blessed above all the peoples. Those are not survivors. You're not a survivor. He said, you shall be blessed above all the peoples. That means even the blessed will call you blessed. The rich will call you rich. The wise will call you wise. The happy will call you happy. Okay? Hallelujah. The great will call you great. The influential will call you influential. 
Okay, the powerful will call you powerful. Those in glory will call you glorious. The anointed will call you anointed. You'll be above the average people. Hallelujah. And there shall not be, the Bible says, male or female barren among you or among your cattle. None. And he says, and the Lord will take away from you all sickness. This is part of Job 8, 7. It's part of great increase. He's not just increasing your finances. No, he's saying he will take away all sickness and none of the evil diseases of Egypt, that is the fallen world, that's symbolic of the fallen world, which you knew will he put upon you, but will lay them upon all who hate you. Oh my God, I feel sorry for those that fight you. But he said he will not let the sicknesses of the heathen to fall on your life. That means not only will you be wealthy, successful in ministry and all the other aspects, he says he will keep you healthy, robust with life and strength from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. And this is the heritage of his saints and their righteousness is of me, God says in Isaiah. And let me say this, our growth, our multiplication is irrespective of the challenges of the present hour. It's irrespective of the challenges of the present circumstances. It is irrespective of where we are. It is irrespective of what we are going through at that particular moment, of the circumstances that are surrounding us at that present moment. In Isaiah 53, when they're talking about the growing of this shoot, the person of Christ, in Isaiah 53 from verse 1, he says, Who shall believe our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? When he starts to define this Christ, he says, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. The plant will grow tender. It won't be thick. It won't be hardened by circumstances. It will be tender as one that is nourished and fed with the most perfect conditions. He says, He shall grow up before him as a tender plant. He says, and as a root, listen, out of a dry ground. The ground is not soft. The ground is not palatable. The ground is not pliable to the event, all right? The ground is dry, yes, but he shall grow up. He grows in the dry places. Even in the desert, the Bible says, you shall blossom. You shall blossom, even in the desert. The Son of God we're talking about here did not have a fertile ground from whence he grew. No. The ground was dry. Perhaps there was no rain. Perhaps the heat was not favorable. But he said, but he shall still grow as a tender plant. How amazing that this portion of scripture has that depth. And the whole depth is in the dry ground. The ground was dry, had no water, had nothing but this man is still growing out. That means he shall come from the hardest circumstances and still grow out and be who he was. Jesus did not grow from the most favored circumstances. He was not born in a five-star hotel, but he grew. In his age, the Herodian spirit sought to kill all firstborn childs, but he still made it. And so are the patriarchs. In the time of Moses, they wanted to claim all the first boys. And what happens? This fellow survives on a basket on a lake. Because that's who we are. We make it in spite of how bad stuff is. The thing that could not let Moses die, the thing that could not let the Christ die before he fulfilled his assignment, is the same thing that will keep you in spite of what? Whatever they have said on your life, present circumstances, disease in your body, whatever it is, because God called you, he will sustain you. But you must understand how called you are of God, how anointed you are of God. Oh, you can say that, Apostle Grace, because you, no, 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 find yourself, you'll be amazed. You'll be amazed at what God has placed in the inside of you. People die when they do not know what God has called them to be. But when God calls you, when God makes you understand who you are, he said, make your calling and election sure. Understand why he has anointed you 
Understand why he has called you. Understand why he has separated you. He says, make your calling and election sure. He says, do it with all diligence to make your calling and election sure. And he says, for if you do these things, he says, you shall never fail. You shall never fail. He said, you'll never fail. So why are people failing? You still don't know who you are. You still don't know what your part is in the world. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So this is a Christ, right? In Hosea 14, I saw something amazing, verse 5. In Hosea 14, verse 5, I saw something wonderful with this prophetic voice. He says, I will be as the dew and to Israel, listen, he shall grow as the lily and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. Wow. This is amazing. And I'll explain why. If you are to talk about a lily, if you're talking about a lily in Lebanon, if you're talking about a lily in Macedonia, if you're talking about a lily in Israel, you're talking about a wild lily. All right? Now, there are many kinds and sorts of lilies, but when I took time to study, all right, I realized that the lilies that grow in Israel, the lilies that grow in Lebanon, in Macedonia, and all those areas, the lilies that grow in such areas are wild. All right? And because they are wild, they are not intentionally seeded or planted by man. That means they are beyond the aid of man, they are beyond the planning of man, the pruning of man, the watering. No, no, no. They are not subject to a man's hand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I hope you're getting what I'm saying. They are not subject to a man's hand. That means when God pours dew on you, you will grow without a man's hand. Whether they help you or they don't help you, he will still grow you. Whether they are on your side or they are not on your side, he will still favor you. Whether you are advantaged to them or disadvantaged to them, God will still increase you. Because your increase is not based on their aid, not their comfort, not their approval or disapproval. It's not based on what they say or don't say about you. Uh -uh. It's not based on whether they gave you that job or they didn't. Whether they fired you today or they hired you, your success is bigger than a man's hand than a man's aid, than a man's help. And when he goes on to say that you shall cast forth your roots as Lebanon, what is Lebanon? Lebanon is a rocky place. By topography, it's rocky. Okay? It doesn't have stable land. It has a long, hot summer. It's not even an advantage to grow stuff in Lebanon. That's where God says, I can still grow you there. I can still grow you in the driest, most patched places, most stroky places. I can still find a way to give life to you. That means whether you are born in a third world country or a first world country, whether your parents were rich or they were not rich, whether you had a good education or you were never educated at all, whether you have networks or you don't have networks, whether people call you or you've never been called, whether you match or don't match, whether you fit or don't fit, whether you are advantaged or disadvantaged, whether you are short or tall, dark or brown, whether you are, you know, you're a monarch or you're a normal person born in a normal family, to God he says that is irregardless it's regardless it has no bearing with greatness and increase but he says but what you choose to believe from today does the attitude you choose to carry from now does i cannot speak about your last five years or four years or three years i cannot say those but i can speak about this moment and tell you that what you choose to believe from this moment is going to define greatness and increase in your life. It's either going to grow you or destroy you. And to know, I cannot tell whether this season of COVID is going to lock your businesses longer or some of you are going to lose jobs. In it. I don't know what will happen or will befall you, but this is what I know for sure. Your latter end shall be greatly increased. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Father, I thank you. For the entrance of your word brings light and giveth understanding to the simple. I have shared. I have spoken. I have given from the liberality of my heart and the consequences of my experiences touching you. I am persuaded that there are even some watching and listening in 
and connect or some even have testimonies bigger. We decree and we declare that our latter end shall be greatly increased. And I speak for that man or woman. I don't know where you began from, whether you're on a journey or your journey begins today. But may you note it right now in the calendar of your spiritual history that something has taken place that has placed an indelible mark on your destiny, touching your ministry, your finances, your career, your life, your marriage, and everything that touches you. And I decree and I declare in the mighty name of Jesus, like the psalmist says, and the Lord shall increase me always. So God will increase you always. Greatness is yours. Your increase will be great. Your growth will be evident. Your profit will be testified by all, in spite of whatever happens. In Jesus' mighty name we prayed and believed. Amen. If you're sick in your body, I speak healing. If you're bound in whatever area, you are free tonight. Not tomorrow. Now faith is. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed and believed. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. If you're there and you've never given your life to Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to receive him as your personal Lord and Savior. If not now, when? I cannot tell what's going to happen next week or next year, but I can tell you that he that hath the Son, the Bible says, has life. The Bible says there is no name under the earth by which men are saved, save the name of Jesus. And that's the one I want to give you because of the sound of that name, every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And I want to give you an opportunity to confess these words with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word. Tonight, I give you my heart, my life, my plans, and I submit to you as my Lord and Savior, thank you for shedding your blood for me and being raised for my glory. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero, make manifest.